It's the story of our land. A story of early Ohioans and the mark they left behind. Here is the blueprint of the site before it was developed, showing the embankment and the two mounds. How ancient hunting grounds give way to farms and families. And how the land turns a blind eye. Are you ready to go? The Underground Railroad was very secretive. You could not be out during the daytime. It's a story of how the land feeds a community and then a city. And with that, a neighborhood feeds its soul. It's a story of sustainability and how a neighborhood's identity today is intertwined with the history of its land. It's buy local, it's eat local, it's bank local. This is the story of Clintonville. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... Since 1921, the State Auto Group has called Columbus Neighborhoods home, offering personal and business insurance through independent insurance agents. For your car, home, and business, the State Auto Group. As we've grown and changed with Columbus, we've never lost sight of one thing. We are neighbors serving neighbors. Chase and its more than 15,000 Central Ohio associates are proud to celebrate the historic neighborhoods of Columbus. American Electric Power Foundation, a resource for charitable initiatives and communities served by AEP and beyond to improve people's lives through education, basic needs, healthcare, and the arts. The law firm of Bailey Cavalieri, a local firm with a national presence, baileycavalieri.com. And by these and other local foundations and families, and viewers like you. Thank you. I was born September 9th, 1837. I am a Wyandotte Indian and the sole surviving full-blooded member of that tribe. Our tribe were of a religious nature and had their worship trees, under the branches of which they worshiped God, whom they called the Great I Am. I attribute my long life to living close to nature and observe the custom of my tribe in sleeping out of doors in the summer and one night of each month throughout the winter with only one blanket for cover. On my next birthday, I will be 100 years old. We were really blessed in our sixth grade class to have a, a new young teacher. And his name was Merrill Stevens, or better known as Cookie in the community, who had really innovative ideas. 1953, a growing community is pushing the boundaries of the city. But some Clintonville school kids learn they aren't the first to live here. The Dominion Land Company was developing this area between Glenmont and Euronia, putting a road through, and in that they found this Adena Indian Mound. The site originally consisted of an embankment wall that was around 2.9 acres and originally two mounds. When OHS got on site, there was a lot of bulldozing going on at the time, and it was a salvage archaeology project to come in and try to get as much information before it was just completely gone. Here is the blueprint of the site before it was developed, showing the embankment and the two mounds. And under one of the mounds were these post-mold patterns that were found. These are small pits where a wooden post or a part of a tree would have been put in and it may have held a structure or a fence. There was a burial that was found, and it was of a six to eight year old child. The thinking is that that would have been a structure that was used as a mortuary complex. And when they were finished using the structure, they tore it down or burned it down and then memorialized it by building a mound over top of it. People actually used the pits to put things into them and bury them down there. 
The assemblage consisted of about 90% pottery. So there's a thought that these deposits were left over from the funerary gathering. These were large barrel-shaped vessels that probably held uh, upwards of five gallons. We would traipse across the ravine and up about every day to go watch the excavating of this mound. People have been here over 10,000 years. The area had the rivers, the floodplains, a very rich environment with lots of different plants and animals to eat. For thousands of years, the Adena, Hopewell people, and Native Americans had been living in what we today call Clintonville. Bill Moose would be one of the last and one of the most beloved. Bill was born in Upper Sandusky. The Wyandots were removed from Ohio to Kansas in 1847. Bill Moose and his parents, along with 50 other Indians that refused to leave. No one knows exactly where all the families went, but Bill Moose's family came to Columbus in an area now known as High Banks Metro Park. Bill Moose joined the Sells Brothers Circus in the late 70s and traveled all over the world, including to Australia. The Bill Moose story hit its peak when Bill Moose moved to Clintonville. He collected berries, he hunted, he trapped, but he also, in full Indian regalia, ate at the Wyandotte Country Club. The year was 1915 is when he built this little shelter. The sign on there said, Home of Indian Bill Moose, Survivor of the Wyandotte Indians. He told his story to Leonard Ensley, a reporter who was fascinated that Moose was still living in the tradition of his ancestors. And Leonard was so engrossed with the story, he said, Bill, if I could make a postal card for you and you could sell this for a quarter, he said, that could be a living. So he made a postal card. On one side of the card, Bill standing in front of his cabin, proud. And on the back side was what he told Leonard Ensley, which was an autobiography. Everybody was so nice to him. My mother baked many pies and took them up to him. Bill loved kids, and the kids came in groves to hear his story. My father had a horse here, a pony, and a lot of other kids in the neighborhood had horses too. And they called themselves the Clintonville Pony Club. And the kids apparently would just take off on their ponies and ride all through Clintonville. And the most special thing he talked about was going to visit um, a Native American man. Later on, when my father grew up, he became interested in photography. And one of the photographs he took was this picture of Bill Moose. And he called it Vanishing American by John Kessler, my dad. When Bill Moose died in 1937, 20,000 people attended the funeral. His epitaph reads, Bill Moose, last of the Wyandas, born 1837, and whose death in 1937 marks the passing of the Indians from this territory. Balzer Hess was a Revolutionary War soldier who basically arrived in the Ohio country when many people were coming out here to find a new life and a new land. He was a cobbler and a tanner by trade, and he and his family acquired several hundred acres on the west side of the Olentangy River, uh, north of Doddridge Street today. In 1803, there really wouldn't have been anybody this far north until you got to Worthington. Balzer Hess and his son cut a road through the forest all the way from downtown Franklinton, sort of the center of things in those days, all the way up to his property. His family's cemetery becomes the starting point of Union Cemetery. When he died in 1806, he was buried on the family farm, and that is part of what is today's Union Cemetery. Okay, Taylor, step up. David Beers was genuinely a frontiersman. He and his sister had been captured by the Indians and held for a considerable period of time by them. He eventually returned. He built a grist mill. His house was a trading post where people stopped coming up through the ravine as they were making their way along the Warriors Trail from Lake Erie to the Ohio River. Clintonville gets its name from Clinton Township, which was named for George Clinton, a very popular governor in New York. One of the first settlers was Thomas Bull. In many ways, the story of Clintonville starts with the Bull family. Thomas Bull Jr. came from Vermont. He bought 687 acres from about Brevoort down to Weber Road. 
and from the river to what we now know as Indianola Avenue. Thomas Bull arrived in this part of the world in 1812 with his wife and family. He carved himself a home out of the virgin forest and made farmland where trees had once been, grew Indian corn, and generally transformed the land. Even this early in its history, the land was in transition. The frontier was becoming farmland. The pioneers had made settlement possible. One year after Thomas Bull arrived in 1812, his daughter Chloe arrived with her husband, Isaac Brevort, and moved into a house that Thomas Bull had built. Tragically, while trying to cross the swollen Olentangy River, Isaac Brevort drowned and was lost. Thomas Bull's three sons become instrumental in Clintonville's early growth. Nathan was a physician and an educator. Alonson was a director of the company that improved the road to Worthington. In 1847, Alanson Bull, along with some of his relatives and other folks, decide to set up a few stores and shops in the vicinity of what is now North High Street and East North Broadway. The post office he establishes comes to be called Clintonville because it sits smack in the middle of Clinton Township. That marks the starting point of Clintonville as a named entity. Another son, Jason Bull, was a circuit-riding preacher in the burgeoning Methodist denomination and carved out a piece of his share of the family land for a church. The sons of Thomas Bull are not only building a community in the wilds of Ohio, they're exercising their strong abolitionist beliefs and creating a network for fugitive slaves. The Underground Railroad in Ohio was like a spider web of routes and trails. Probably the major route is what is now Route 23, coming from Portsmouth, Ohio, up the Souter River Corridor, right into Columbus, and then going on to Lake Erie. The Clinton Chapel was the first church in Clintonville, and Jason Bull became the preacher. But his work went beyond delivering a sermon for the faithful each Sunday. He was a zealous abolitionist and served as a conductor on the Underground Railroad along with his immediate family and some of his friends in the neighborhood. The mother of these gentlemen does not realize that they are actively engaged in this work until Alonzo leaves an abolish magazine on the coffee table. And she was incensed. She said she would never live under the same roof as an abolitionist. He ends up building a wing onto his house so that she can actually live separate from the rest of the family but still be supported by that. <laughs> the chapel that was very much connected with the Bull family was really the hiding place that we can point to. Fugitive slaves were brought to behind the chapel possibly to stay near the wood pile in the woods. And if you know Wall Hall, you know it's very wooded. Are you ready to go? And then if they needed to, they were brought into the chapel area in a room that was accessed only by the attic. So it was no apparent doorway. And then when they were safe, they were brought out and brought up High Street into Worthington or to Westerville. The Underground Railroad was a highly illegal operation. Those who were involved with it really took their lives in their own hands. We sometimes have the impression that many people worked on the Underground Railroad in Ohio because to an extent it's our enduring myth. The fact of the matter is most people didn't. It was a crime to basically help runaway slaves escape to freedom and you could be fined heavily and in fact even imprisoned. Many people kept their activities on the Underground Railroad quite secret. A good example of that is Cynthia Bull who once wrote a letter she would be given a basket as if she was going to collect eggs, but there were provisions in the basket. She would take uh, that little basket and feed them many times while he was preaching. Even though the Bull family built the chapel and used it as an underground railroad station, disagreements split the congregation. The chapel became the home of Matthias Armbruster. He was more interested in painting than repenting. He owned a studio in downtown Columbus that created theatrical backdrops. It was about the second largest uh, scenic studio in the United States around the turn of the century. And at that time, it was the largest that was actually just doing theater. As early as photography was, he took pictures 
all over the city, all over the country, actually all over the world. He continued to travel and he would take pictures and paint them into the scenery. They would paint the drops in the scenery for a lot of the touring shows that would come through town. Vaudeville shows, minstrel shows. Some of the shows that would come through were magic shows. So they painted drops for Howard Thurston, who was a very famous magician who was actually also born in Columbus. He sold off a piece of his property to a developer with the stipulation that he would retain the right to name the streets. An admirer of Norse mythology, he named one of them Walhalla which means the Hall of the Gods. The old Clinton Chapel had served as a church and then as a home for an artist. And with the death of Matthias Armbruster, it would find another life. Grandpa used to work for the railroad, and then he decided for some reason to become a funeral director. So he started business in 23 and moved over here in 38. One day we were in the attic, the original beams of the building are there, and I reached up and there was a box and it was glass negatives. This is a picture of Mr. Armbruster, and this was in his garden area. This one is looking from the south on High Street toward the north. The family owned several properties in addition to the Clinton Chapel. This is a picture taken from the attic looking south on High Street, and at that time High Street had trees down through there. It was like a boulevard. And this is one of the amusement rides at the Old Tangy Park. Many of the properties in Clintonville are changing hands among prominent families. You can see where they lived and ran businesses by checking the street signs. Cook and Henderson, for instance. Cook family was huge. There's hundreds of them, and they've got their own little borough. They've got churches and schools, they've got a mill, and they called their farm Maple Grove. The church took its name from a stately mansion at Henderson and High. Among the estate's owners was the Aldrich family. Edgar Aldrich made his fortune as an electrical engineer and retired in his 40s and traveled the world with his wife. As luck would have it, they happened to be on site the day of the discovery of King Tut's tomb. Since the National Geographic did not have their people on site, Helen and Edgar became what we would think of as the CNN of their day, giving news feeds to the outside world along with their photographs. Edgar and his wife seemed to lead a charmed life. They were friends with Lord Carnarvon, who bankrolled the King Tut expedition, and lived at High Clare Castle of Downton Abbey fame. But no one could escape the curse of King Tut. Lord Carnarvon died of an infected mosquito bite. The Aldriches died in a car accident. Helen was wearing a ring that was given to her by Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon. The fact is the ring still exists within the family and no one even to this day has the temerity to wear it. <laughs> By the late 1890s, Clinton Township had around 2,100 people and about a fourth of the population was engaged in agricultural work. It was a place where farmers raised clover seed, oats, apples, pears, cherries, wheat, hay, plum, grapes, and vegetables. Its proximity to Columbus made it an oasis for those wanting to escape the grime, pollution, and bustle of the city. Developers like Herman Dennison and James Lauren decide that the far north side of town, five or six miles out, might be a place to build a luxury suburb. East North Broadway is an interesting area within the context of Clintonville. It was actually designed and platted to be a major street, and there was a requirement that if you built on the street, you had to spend at least $3,000 on the house. So they had a minimum price, which was quite significant at that time. One guy will buy five lots, and the lots of the Lauren and Denison subdivision are all one acre. So these larger lots facilitate many farms. So the Acton property is actually known for its peaches and cherries and people play croquet. The neighborhood was starting to develop, but even by 1910, there were only about 20 homes on the street. It was still country living. Once you built your house, you had to grow your own food because there were no stores. Some of the women in the big new houses were getting bored. You have a combination of farm ladies and city ladies. And the city ladies, their husbands are riding the trolley downtown. And so they're here with their children looking for things to do. And in 1912, a book salesman comes through the area. And he talks to these ladies about this fabulous learning tool that he's selling. 
So they decide to form this kind of group. So they start to explore new methods that are being talked about in these books. So things like hot lunch, they start serving hot lunch at the school. They also start to work on baby camps where you know, babies need a lot of fresh air and sunshine. So I guess we take them out for fresh air and sunshine. After 25 years of meeting at each other's homes, they decided that for their 25th anniversary, they would make the scrapbook. They went into their own personal collections of newspaper articles and photographs, and then they wrote down their recollections that went with those photographs. Here's the Brevoort. This is the Brevoort's house. This is the house that is on North High Street. It would have been actually on the east side of High, but these photos back here show the, river. the riverside of the Brevoort land. They love to make apple butter here in Clintonville. When you came here to Ohio, you needed to be able to farm the land. So being able to plant apples and use them to make apple butter or to make apple jam, and then use the rinds and the leftovers to fatten hogs, lots There was several distilleries, there were several orchards, there were several vineyards. This is a picture of a dairy um, operation, which dairy farming was pretty popular in the Clintonville area. In the early days, farm boys and girls drove to school in buggies and carriages. For many years, the long sheds used for stabling the horses remained near the building. Clearing away these old edifices was one of the early missions of the Clinton Lake. So this is an absolutely beautiful picture of the 1904 annex building sitting out in the middle of a field <laughs> all by itself. This is a house on Dunedin, just a huge open land. And those pictures are underneath a headline that says, Our Suburban Homes. <laughs> this is fabulous. I love this. So there was a tradition of having goats and little ponies, and people would come around with their cameras and take pictures of your kids with the goats or the little ponies. And there's a whole bunch of kids getting their pictures taken with the horse and the goat and the goat wagon. The Clinton Lake was all women. They were in existence through World War I, the flu epidemic of 1918, the Great Depression, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam era. With all of that, and they talk about all of their good deeds, but they barely mentioned the vote in 1920. And I just found that astonishing that that wasn't one of their projects. Since the first white settlers had cleared land for cabins there, Clintonville had been a small settlement between Columbus and Worthington. But at the turn of the century, it was becoming less remote. Streetcars connected Clintonville to Columbus, and an interurban railroad connected it to nearby towns. You could also leave town on an electric trolley that would go at the then stupendous speed of probably 45, 50, maybe 60 miles an hour. There was a small, very ornate depot that was situated at the point where North Broadway dead-ended at the railroad tracks. And it was an interesting station because it actually served not only the railroad, but it also served the Columbus, Delaware, and Marion interurban line. When you drive or walk up Indianola Avenue, a lot of the buildings are set back at a fairly good distance from the street. The reason for that is that was the right-of-way of the streetcar line. The streetcars replaced horses, but you still had to have a barn for storage and maintenance. In Clintonville, it was at the corner of Arcadia and North High. It was eventually torn down and they built one of the first White Castle restaurants in Columbus there. The streetcar was also a convenient way to get to a popular picnic and canoeing area on the south end of Clintonville. At the end of the streetcar line, it was wonderful to have something that people would go to on weekends. In 1899, the Duesenbury brothers bought Olentangy Park from the Columbus Railway Company and they ushered in the golden age of Olentangy Park. And what Olentangy Park did was decide to make this amusement park a family-friendly amusement park. The brothers added rides, turned the historic Beers Mill into an attraction, and made other improvements that made the park more family-friendly. They also built a summer theater at the park that seated a thousand more people in the largest theater downtown. On a visit to the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis, the Duesenberry brothers saw the fascination people had with a Japanese exhibit. They managed to relocate many of the features from the fair to Olentangy Park. 
Olentangy Park was a popular place for reunions and company picnics. Cromwell Dixon is seen here in a 1907 picnic with the president of Olentangy Park, J.W. Duesenbury. Cromwell Dixon was known as the youngest aeronaut and inventor in the world. At age 14, he invented what was called a sky cycle. One of his first flights was made at Olentangy Park. Olentangy Park was the most popular amusement park in the area. It featured four roller coasters operating simultaneously, including a figure eight, a scenic coaster that paralleled High Street and later became the Red Devil, and a loop the loop. It was an early design that was very circular in nature, so when you went into the loop, the forces kind of slammed you into the hill, and it gave a lot of people whiplash. <laughs> that combined with the fact that some people got stuck sitting at the top, and the fact that they had very thin <laughs> bars holding people in, equaled the demise of the loop-de-loop -loop by about 1912. Those who couldn't muster the courage for the coasters could visit a 10-acre zoo and floral conservatory at the southern end of the park. The dance hall at the park was made of steel, so a wayward cigarette or cigar butt wouldn't send it up in smoke. You would buy a ticket, get out on the dance floor, and then once the tune was finished, you would be ushered off the floor by a large rope that would basically rustle everyone off the floor like cattle. One of the park's showpieces was an elaborate carousel that featured the spectacular and flamboyant creations of Marcus Illions, at one time considered the preeminent carver of carousel horses. Men would be there in their full suits and ties. Women would be there in full dresses, usually white dresses, large hats. The carousel was renovated in 2000 by Carousel Works in Mansfield, Ohio, and still thrills people of all ages at the Columbus Zoo. Olentangy Park featured one of the largest swimming pools in the Midwest, where thousands of bathers gathered. The park required you to rent one of their bathing suits, which added a certain amount of drama to the experience. Sometimes they were baggy and a little ill-fitting and had a tendency to kind of fall off. Olentangy Park also had a feature that delighted young kids, and that was tanned to the baby elephant. He used to walk around the grounds. They would let people climb up on him. And at certain times, they let him swim in the pool. For a graduation party, I was allowed to take my girlfriend, Betty, to Old Tansy Park. And they had a tunnel of love you could go into. And that's pretty handy to go with my future wife. Nice trip through the tunnel of love. Then it became less popular. People had other diversions. They had cars. They were less reliant on streetcars. And by the 1930s, it was purchased by L.L. Levesque, and it was demolished, and that's where Olentangy Village is today. They wanted to do a Georgian architecture. The original pictures had a lot more apartments here. They had mid-rise. I mean, it was very high density. It was the first big apartment complex that was built here in Columbus. And also be a community. It was going to have the grocery store. It was going to have shops and restaurants. The Village Tavern was very popular the beauty shop. The major bakery in Columbus was G. Antonio's Bakery. It was known for its wedding cakes. It later became Mozart's Bakery. A bowling alley at the Olentangy Village was the first in the nation to use automatic pin setters. The system was devised by Ohio State students and the design was sold to the AMF company. The bowling alley remained popular until 1980 when it was destroyed by fire. Investigators speculated the blaze began in the basement room where the pin setter motors were located. That was a real sad day for people when that bowling alley was burnt. Columbus was a very small town for a very long time. It was farmland surrounding central cities. And as the value of property goes up with, with urban growth, farmland gets sold. The undeveloped land that had been so important when Clintonville was a farming town was disappearing, and one of Clintonville's last large pieces of land was held by a larger-than-life figure. Pat Renan was flamboyant, tall, flashy dresser, always looking for a good spoiling fight, never met a person he didn't like, and yet he was generous to a fault. He grew up on the north side, went to Sacred Heart School for a little bit, attended Ohio State for a very little bit, and seems to have had an early passion for gambling. One day he chanced into a gambling establishment and played and won. 
he actually won the gambling establishment. So now he's a gambler. Pat Renan's gambling establishment was really at the corner of Broad and High. And it was above a restaurant, Dorson's Restaurant. I imagine very much like a, one of those smoke-filled, crowded rooms with a lot of things happening back and forth. If you went into a gambling establishment as elaborate as Pat Mernan's, it was not simply two poker tables sitting over at the side of the room. What most people probably came to a gambling establishment to do was either play roulette on the one hand or play cards on the other. Any city of any size has always had a little bit of vice associated with it. In most cities, it's pretty well hidden through most of the 19th century. Columbus, like most cities of its size, has not one but several vice districts. Presiding over this in the center of things is a man named Pat Mernan. Mernan's first wife, Carrie, died young. He remained a bachelor until he fell for the charms of Columbus's most famous madam, Grace Backenstow. She came from Athens, Ohio as a child. Her name was Grace Darty. The next thing we know about her, she was married to George Backenstow. And she and George were a colorful pair. She obviously met her match when she married George. He ran a saloon on Chestnut Street downtown. And right up the street from his saloon, Grace ran a whorehouse. She's sort of a shadowy figure, ethereal, and very much an independent woman who doesn't allow her business to be interrupted in any way by Pat Renan. In 1910, in the census, Grace is listed as a divorcee, and she's living downtown in a house with a number of young women lodgers as they're listed in the census. And that's probably where she met Pat Renan, who had a business very close by. It must have been a real open town because all of this was going on right down where Lazarus now is. There's a bit of folklore and mystique surrounding Pat and Grace's relationship. How did they find each other? Were they married or not? Was Grace Pat's mistress? What we do know is that they were very much in love. Grace and Pat own a piece of property up north off High Street and it was originally owned by the Jeffrey family. It's huge, and it starts at the Olentangy River and goes all the way over to High Street. And it's one of the last truly great big pieces of property left between Columbus and Worthington. There were at least three loves in Pat Mernan's life, gambling, horse racing, and grace. He stabled 60 thoroughbreds at his beloved Clintonville horse farm. He called it Graceland. You gonna win my race for me, make me some bucks, huh? Pat Mernan was also a philanthropist, which was kind of surprising to most people. He would meet somebody at the door and say, you've gambled enough, you can't afford to waste any more of your money. Or he'd grab somebody at the table and say, you've lost enough, it's time for you to go home, take care of your wife, take care of your kids, they need the food, you don't need to spend any more money. Pat Renan was very religious and was Catholic. He gave to just numbers of charities. He also made it very possible for Wesley Glenn to be established with the Virginia Gay Trust. Virginia Walcott Gay was a resident of Central Ohio. In 1905, she established in her will a trust for a retirement community for women of culture and refinement who were retired school teachers. To be a school teacher at the turn of the century, you could not be married. So these were women without pensions, these were women without husbands, therefore they were women without children to help provide for them in their old age. She passed away in 1914, and the will was to immediately become effective, and then there was a will contest. And the nieces contested the will, and the battle over the will and the proceeds of the estate went on until 1930. The will was upheld, and Pat Mernan sells the Virginia Gay Trust, the northern part of his Graceland estate. The Virginia Gay Home opened in 1932, and retired school teachers lived there until 1966, when the United Methodist Church purchased it and established Wesley Glen, a church-affiliated retirement community. Virginia Walcott Gay, she really was a woman of vision, and I'm very grateful to her, because I think we've been able to carry on her mission of providing quality care. <laughs> Since he seems to be the one and only gambler that everybody knows, it seems to have been his patriotic duty to keep the mob out of Columbus during Prohibition. Pat Mernan is ratting all these guys out. And he's wanting to make sure that he is the bad experience in town. And the Columbus Police Department is supporting him in that. Pat was always known as somebody who didn't back away from a fight. And he had that famous fiery Irish temper. 
but he had that large heart of gold. He steps in a sidewalk fight to break up two people and is stabbed. He recovers from it, but never fully regains his health. When Pat Mernan died in 1937, it was one of the largest funerals in Columbus's history. But that wasn't the end of the Pat Mernan story. The family did not really have relations with him because they didn't approve of the businesses he was in. So when he passed away, they were all sure they were going to get some money. But Grace maintained until her death two years later that she was Pat's wife. There was no proof that there had been a marriage, so the court had to settle the estate. Grace's heirs argued that, in fact, there had been a marriage when the couple vacationed out west. There can be found no papers that say this indeed happened. And later, when this issue will come up in court, there will be a number of eyewitnesses who will say, oh, no, 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 he introduced her as his wife. In the end, the court decided that Pat and Grace were married in 1915. And Grace Mernan's heirs were awarded the Graceland estate. The land was eventually auctioned off to the Roman Catholic Diocese for the purpose of building a high school, but they changed their mind and built Bishop Watterson High School in a different location. So when the property is sold finally to Don Castro Sr. and Don Castro Jr., and there are development plans to build a shopping center there, in the end what happens is that Pat has exactly what he's always wanted, that somehow his beloved Grace is remembered and Graceland Shopping Center is born out of that. My grandfather wanted to buy it. It was a little bit uh, difficult because I don't think he had the money to buy it at the time. And he arranged at the last minute to sort of hook up with the Gibson family out of Warren, Ohio. The Gibson company did the physical building of the shopping centers. Casto put life in them by renting them to a prescribed mix. You have a little bit of something to appeal to everybody. We were very fortunate to have the union store. J.C. Penney was there. You take your child there and for a penny, a pound, get their picture taken. The Big Bear used to be there. That was kind of the anchor store. I remember that was a big thing when I was little because there were ponies outside that you got to put in a dime and get to ride. It was the location of one of the first Woolco stores in the country, which was the F.W. Woolworth Five and Dime store's effort to reinvent themselves into a discount store. By the time Graceland opened, Clintonville's farms had given way to bakeries and soda fountains and mom and pop stores. It seemed like Main Street USA ran right through Clintonville. I do remember Isley's ice cream store at the corner of North Broadway and High Street. Our parents would give us money to go to church on Sunday and we would sneak out and go to Isley's and use our, the money we were supposed to put in the collection to <laughs> wait, would go to Isley's for ice cream. They were the first ones that had um, chip chop ham. <laughs> and everybody had to go have chip chop ham. You'd get really? a pile of ham like that. Everyone loved the skyscrapers. It was a big, tall ice cream cone, about this big, one scoop, straight up. Residents were devoted to many of these local family-owned businesses. Beachwald Hardware has been in the Smith family since 1944. And personal service was the trademark of Bernie Pennell, who kept cars running for years at his Clintonville garage. The older ladies just adored him. He liked going out and washing their windshield and checking their oil and uh, pumping their gas. That attention to personal service was embraced by neighborhood grocery stores. You didn't have to push a cart up and down the aisles at Wylands on Indianola Avenue and Garden Road. We did have a delivery service. We had trucks that would, people would call in their order, we would fill the order, take it out, deliver it. And service was an important part of the experience at Clintonville's diners and restaurants. Many of them were so small and intimate, you were rubbing elbows with the cook across the counter. Warren's sandwich shop was about this big. I mean, it was just this teeny, really, hole in the wall. Warren was this tall, lean man who, I just remember flipping hamburgers endlessly, day and night. Jerry's drive-in was at the corner of Morse and High Street. So imagine 1950s leather jackets and poodle skirts and Jerry's. We'd pull up in the car, my dad would roll down the window, and you'd speak into a little speaker to make your order, and then someone would bring it out to the car and hang it on the window. Everybody drive around the parking lot 
at Jerry's on a Saturday night or after a football game at North. The famous thing about Jerry's Drive-In was the fact that it had the city's biggest sign, neon, probably about 40 feet high. The sign is quite large and it's probably larger than is permitted this day and age. Some Clintonville families are revered for the burgers they made or the ice cream they churned. The gathering places they developed helped create a sense of community. And other Clintonville families forged Clintonville's identity in different ways. C.C. Hollenbeck really made his money and made his name by being an officer in the American Insurance Union, which was a combination insurance company and secret society that built the American Insurance Union Citadel, which is now the Levesque Tower. He was an early adapter of everything technological. One of the things that he was really, really interested in was photography. He was taking pictures everywhere. He loved to travel. He uh, went to the Chicago World's Fair there's a really interesting picture that he had someone take of him in a rickshaw. He was a publisher. When he bought property at California and High, he created the Press of Hollenbeck. CC's son, Rand Hollenbeck, founded the Clintonville Booster newspaper, which became a fixture in the area for many, many years. The reason that Grandfather Hollenbeck started the newspaper during the Depression was, first of all, his interest in the community, but also he needed to make some money and even the little profit that he could get out of the ads in the newspaper kept the press of Hollenbeck afloat. The outcome of having the Clintonville Booster is the community developed a very distinct and robust identity. If there was anything going on, whether it was the local baseball team or women's issues and, and things, he was involved in it, he had an opinion on it, and he was writing about it. Editorial advocacy at its finest and he was able to cross party lines and make deals that we don't seem to be able to make today. One of those deals involved the E.A. Fuller Farm, one of the last of the old Clintonville farms. It was a popular picnic and gathering spot. In an era of ambitious developments, Rand Hollenbach thought it should be preserved in its natural state. The first person that he talked to was the farmer. And when he finally got to the, the farmer's agreement on, yeah, I think we can do this, then it came time to sit down with the mayor. It happened in the White Castle on, on Arcadia. So we have my grandfather, Rand, the farmer, and the mayor sitting down over sliders and coffee. And uh, that's how that deal was made. The deal for Whetstone Park happened over, probably at that point in time, a five cent slider. And if you think about that in today's circumstance, how that farmer could have made a lot more money if he'd sold out to a developer. And there would be homes along that beautiful ravine. Whetstone Park opened in 1949, and three years later it would get its signature feature, the Park of Roses, which was created by the Columbus Rose Club and the Central Ohio Rose Society. The Rose Garden is 13 acres, and there are 400 and 75 varieties of roses, and every year we're increasing the number of varieties. The park became the community's gathering place. Every Father's Day, a maiden of the roses was crowned at a festival. Holidays were a special time at the park. One of the things that uh, I remember is the Easter egg hunts that were in the lower meadow. There are hundreds and hundreds of kids down here with their baskets. It was utter chaos, but what I remember most is my father and all the other Kiwanians and JCs walking around and dropping Easter eggs in front of the kids that didn't get any. Everybody would go to the Park of Roses on the 4th of July. You would start out in the morning and they'd have all kinds of booths, games, fishing pond, and you'd spend the whole day there and then the fireworks would go off at night, so you'd lay your blankets out and just sit there until they were over. There'd be the bike parade and the pet parade and be a pie contest and a cake contest, so a real community event. I do remember Christmas parades. Oh yes, that's when Santa came to town. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you would line High Street and wait for the parade. I think it was the Sunday after Thanksgiving, and it would start at North Broadway and High, and the floats went down right in front of the funeral home here. We'd all stand outside and watch, and they took Santa Claus down to Lazarus. Holiday celebrations in Clintonville seem to bring everyone together, but the issues associated with an old farming village transitioning to a bustling suburb caused people to take sides. 
The county built a new bridge across the Olentangy River at West North Broadway, but no one could anticipate that the crabapple trees Clintonville women planted to beautify the area would launch a controversy. World War II breaks out, and so they decide that they're going to offer you know, trees for the memory of um, sons that may be lost in war. My uncle was one of them because he was lost at sea in a sub. He was only 19 years old, and I never really knew him, but I knew him through that story. They end up actually selling 110 trees before they run out of space. So they've got a alley of trees planted on either side of West North Broadway from High Street clear to Olentangy River Road. And under the trees that are associated with the World War II veterans are brass plaques. In preparation for 315 coming through the area, all the city tells these people that they need to get their plaques and trees out of the way. It was very emotional. Because you've got passionate people living here that care. And to see it used as the pathway to a freeway on and off ramps, you know, that was very difficult. There wasn't a week that went by that there wasn't an editorial being written that about we need to move it over to the 71 corridor, we need to, you know, move it further west. In the end, it didn't work out. That was one of those times when it didn't seem like there was any deal making. Clintonville couldn't convince Columbus to move the highway and preserve the cherished memorial and scenic river. But the fight energized the community. The next battle would be over the beloved North High School. A landmark suit alleged that Columbus City Schools were racially segregating students and faculty. So when this decision comes down that Columbus schools are indeed segregated and there will have to be attempts to remedy this based on the fact that two other schools that have closed were predominantly African American, they choose to close North High School. 1979, which was the last graduating class, and they tried to keep the school open. You know, they did everything they could. They had rallies and stuff like that. But we spent a lot of time on Tuesdays at school board meetings, um, arguing our case, presenting cases for other schools possibly to be closed in, instead of North, but ultimately they decided against it and Columbus did desegregate. Closing North was only part of the school system's desegregation remedy in this suit that went all the way to the Supreme Court. As in other Columbus neighborhoods, kids would be bused to schools across town. They split us up. Most of us were at Linden, and, and a lot of the kids from Clintonville got sent over to East as well. With the closing of North High School, there was a real blow to the Clintonville community, and there were a lot of divided feelings about it. There's something good about children growing up in the same neighborhood and having to walk to school. Decades after their high school closed, any memory of time they spent there was bittersweet. But in the 90s, North High School alumni decided it was time to reclaim and celebrate their connection to the school. They started North on the 4th, and this is our homecoming, our chance to come back to the old school and relive memories and, and see friends we haven't seen for years. Well, guess what? We do it every year, year in, year out, because I always say, oh, I hope they come this year, and they don't disappoint me. And they always have a, a White Castle thing under the stadium there, <laughs> and everybody goes out and gets their White Castles. Today, school bells are ringing again at North. Columbus International High School opened there in 2010, and the older residents of Clintonville are thrilled to see their old school coming to life again. As we entered into this incredible building that you really feel the history, you feel the, the spirits that are, are, are still here from almost 100 years ago when the school was built, I think more than anything, we hope to keep the North spirit alive by um, convincing our kids that Columbus is something worth caring about. We want the students to realize that they are members of the community and we want the community to feel like they're also part of our school. Clintonville is proud and protective of its past, but determining the character of present day Clintonville can be elusive. It's more diverse than many realize and in ways many would not imagine. You'll come down from 71 on North Broadway and look at the homes and it looks like they're homes from Gone with the Wind. In the shadows of those mansions are much more modest homes um, and there are folks living in poverty. We have a world's record, 16,000 pounds of food. We've never had more than 11,000. We have our family services program that's been around since the inception of our agency to help those folks to get basic needs like food and clothing and 
just to assure that they have everything that they need. The northern part of our neighborhood has the zip code 43214, which has the highest percentage of seniors of any zip code in Franklin County. So for our older neighbors, um, we have social workers and programs to help them to get everything that they need. Because of the thoughtful way it was developed, Clintonville's connections to its past are still apparent. There are parts of the community where its rural beginnings are still embraced. I'd been thinking about bringing farmers into Clintonville to help our neighbors connect with the land and with the food. The first six farmers, about half of them came from within 20, 30 miles of Columbus. The other half were probably about 50 or 60 miles away. Clintonville is the perfect neighborhood for a farmer's market. Um, people are excited to try new things and producers love coming to our market for that reason. We love the, the farmer's market. Every Saturday morning it's a ritual for us to get up, we put our kids in the wagon, we walk our mile down High Street, we grab our cup of coffee and the kids get their special treat. Many of the vendors at the Clintonville Farmer's Market are also vendors here. We purchase a lot of what we sell here from producers and farmers in the community. There are people here in this community that are making toothpaste, that are making skin lotion. All of this is without chemicals, without the use of GMOs. It's buy local, it's eat local, it's bank local, invest local, all of these good local. So localization of the economy is critical. It's just like the whole ecosystem is uh, benefiting from that way of thinking. Patty Cake is in the process of transitioning to a worker-owned co-op. All of us are part owners, so we buy in and then we help make all the decisions about running the bakery and where the bakery is going to go. The whole reasoning behind deciding to do them by bike was to be more environmentally friendly and not to use gas, and that's kind of our whole motto. The Crest Gastropub, our goal is to grow as much food as we possibly can. So not only are we growing on the roof, but we have what we call our cocktail garden, we've got parking lot gardens, we've got a community garden along the street. So whatever we're, we can't grow in source, we're going to reach out to our local farmers and support them too. The more experience we get, the goal is to limit our needs of the industrial food system and conventional farms. We're going back to the way things were done, should be done. Um, without pesticides, without you know, antibiotics and hormones and this, it's just natural. That's the way it started, that's the way it should be. Ever since I was younger, I've always noticed how people in Clintonville specifically focus on how their actions infect environment. People are very aware of water purification, air quality, growing your own food. You just walk down the streets and you see gardens in people's front yards. Clintonville's earliest settlers were inextricably tied to the land. And even now, some people are finding that the land they live on is an essential part of their Clintonville experience. My dream from childhood on was to be a homesteader. I always envisioned that happening in grandiose places like Alaska and, you know, the wilds. But in fact, it turned out that I had to settle for being an urban homesteader. I've been making uh, maple syrup here in Clintonville for about five years. And uh, what people might not realize is that all you need is a maple tree or two. You drill a hole and the sap starts running if the weather's with you. Not much goes on after the fire and the pouring in of the sap. You just have to watch it and keep adding sap all day. So neighbors generally stop in and ask what you're doing and hang out a little bit. It's so wonderful to have people around you that are interested in keeping up some of those old foodways and traditions. I hear the horror stories of the suburbs, maybe, that have codes saying you can't even put up a clothesline or have a garden. Well, there's none of that in Clintonville. My wife and I and my son all regularly go to Whetstone Park because I drive down Hollenbach Drive and we walk through the park. It's really nice for me to talk to my son about the impact that his family's had on, on the area. Park has just turned into something incredibly important to the community. It's a touchstone that everybody has the opportunity to use. That's not true of a lot of things. 
clean field definitely sells itself. Two minutes from a very busy high street or in Enola, then you're in the middle of the ravine and then you look up and you are like in the middle of the forest. And we made this decision to simplify our lives and come back to our roots. Some of our friends who had not known us prior to that said, why are you moving into the city? And the first time they came to visit us, it was amazing. They'd say, we didn't know this existed. We didn't know this was down here. This is amazing. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... Since 1921, the State Auto Group has called Columbus Neighborhoods home, offering personal and business insurance through independent insurance agents. For your car, home, and business, the State Auto Group. As we've grown and changed with Columbus, we've never lost sight of one thing. We are neighbors serving neighbors. Chase and its more than 15,000 Central Ohio associates are proud to celebrate the historic neighborhoods of Columbus. American Electric Power Foundation, a resource for charitable initiatives and communities served by AEP and beyond to improve people's lives through education, basic needs, healthcare, and the arts. The law firm of Bailey Cavalieri, a local firm with a national presence, baileycavalieri.com. And by these and other local foundations and families, and viewers like you. Thank you.